first thought was, they're here, they're here. Three and a half to four and a half feet tall. Long-limbed, big heads, insect-like looking. They've come for me, uh, most times in the middle of the night, sometimes in the daytime. They are very, very intelligent. I remember yelling at these things and saying, stop this, I hate what you're doing to me. I was shaking, I was really trembling, and every cell in my body was like, I was afraid, I was terrified. It happens anytime, anywhere, over and over, to those who share an experience they cannot entirely define. Like many who say they are abductees, Peter Faust has been visited many times. They have taken him to their ship. He never knows when they will return. What happens after I'm hit with the light is that I'm taken aboard a ship, normally placed on a table. Beings um, kind of look at me, probe me, um, sometimes take sperm samples. in my eyes, my ears, that type of thing. And then um, after that, I'm usually taken into another room and I'm literally shown um, events of the earth. They've showed me future, what, I, what seems to me to be future cataclysmic events that, um, where the earth is headed. They came for a woman we will call Susan. Her children have seen them too. The others, she is afraid to talk openly about what has happened to her. The next thing I remember is being in the air, going up, uh, away from the highway, just sort of feeling. I have the, the feeling of two beings beside me, but I cannot see them. And going into a ship. And then I was examined. Uh, they did some sort of procedure. Uh, on my left side, it's sketchy memories. It's almost as though time is cut, and I don't have a continuous memory. It's very disjointed, and it's very disturbing. Marketing executive Joan Victoria says she has been visited since childhood. They were these five beings, these small, short type of life forms. And I remember running to the back door of my parents' home, trying to get in. And then being taken up and um, feeling very, very compacted and then being in the dark and then seeing a really fine beam of light and realizing I was traveling toward that beam. I can't even, I can't even convey to anybody the terror that was felt by that child at that time. It's just, it would take, you know, literally your breath away because you were so afraid. Dr. John Mack is a respected Harvard psychiatrist and a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Despite a reputation and a career to lose, he insists publicly that he has over 90 patients who have been abducted by aliens. Today, his professional life is devoted to his program for extraordinary experience research. Clinically, I judge them to be speaking authentically, not getting this from some other source, not displacing from some trauma. It is what it is, and I, I, I say that, and I ask my critics, find one F the beginning of an explanation that accounts for this entire phenomenon. And then there's silence. Each thought he was alone, almost hoped to be found delusional. Instead, they found they share an extraordinary reality with hundreds of others. Each story, like all the others. I mean, you put me through psychological testing to rule out delusions, to, to rule out sexual abuse or child abuse or any psychosis or neurosis that the normal psychiatric community would say were the reasons for these memories. Yes, actually, you came out healthier than the average uh, of the population, I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know One of the most of convincing facts to Dr. Mack is that so many tell the same story. 
Many have conscious memories of their abductions. Some remember only fragments. But in hypnotic regression sessions with Dr. Mack, memories become very real. Can't do this to me. Honestly, no, you can't do this to me. You just can't do this to me anymore. Stop it! In this tape made two years ago by Canada's CBC television, Peter hears one of his own regression sessions for the first time. Do this anytime you want. It's a trauma on four levels. It's a trauma because the thing itself is so traumatic to be helpless, to be taken against your will and subjected to these intrusive rape-like procedures. It's traumatic because of the isolation that people feel. They can't talk about it. The parents will say, well, that's your dream again, your, your nightmare. Thirdly, it is philosophically shocking to people's worldview. I mean, this is not supposed to be. This, in our worldview, this is beyond extraordinary. It's impossible. And then the fourth thing is that it can recur at any time. I mean, it's not, it's not like other traumas that are over when they're over. But they can be taken again. It, it was clear from the beginning that my, the sperm that was being taken from me was for some reason. And I wasn't sure of that, but I was, I was aware that it had something to do with breeding and, and reproducing. And then it became clear to me later that that I was somehow producing offspring. I have been presented with children that are half human, half alien, and been told that they're mine. From the stories that I'm hearing from others, it seems like there is a widespread breeding program going on. Susan insists she has carried alien pregnancies. I started to lose my waist. Um, after about four months, it became unmistakable. I could feel the baby rolling and kicking. Uh, I had colostrum come in. Now, this is critical in your husband. Had had a vasectomy, yes. It was not his child, obviously, and you know, I'm as faithful as the day is long. Um, I, I had no explanation for it. Uh, between the time that I went to see Dr. Mack um, and then the time that I went to see the gynecologist, the baby was taken. And uh, I woke up in the morning knowing that the child was gone. Susan says every member of her family has seen the aliens. Both her children have had encounters. My daughter has had one encounter where she woke up around 7 in the morning to find a gray alien standing in her bedroom. Uh, I was woken up to hear my daughter screaming. When my son has uh, things happen, typically I will have the same thing happen the same night. Uh, and he'll talk about the little man coming. Susan says her husband never believed her until he had an experience of his own. Uh, my husband didn't believe me at first, which I fully understand. Here he is sleeping in the bed next to me, and he wasn't seeing anything. Um, this went on for about six months with me trying to convince him. Finally, when I got to the deepest level of frustration, they came to the bedroom one night and showed themselves to him. And from that day on, he's been a staunch supporter. He, he believes because he's seen them. Peter's wife, Jamie, faced an impossible choice. Either her husband was crazy, or what he experienced was real. A powerful experience that she is excluded from, perhaps forever. I think that what affected me the most is that in feeling the withdrawal in our relationship and then finding out that there was a female alien that Peter was connected with, it felt that he couldn't, there was a time when I said, it doesn't feel like you're here with me. You know, we, are we in relationship here together or what? And the, his answer was, no, I'm not here totally with you. I am split. The emotional splitting, like the splitting of his heart, perhaps we might say, that it's half here and half there. 
so that that the full longing of connection with me wouldn't be possible. And that, that was really upsetting. I feel a split very often between here and my commitment to my life here. And that includes Jamie, that includes my profession, that includes my friends and family and everything that I know and I'm working towards here on Earth. And what I also feel is this deep involvement with the extra justice. And that I've had some kind of ongoing relationship with them since I was a child. It appears that there's going to be some future event that I'm going to be involved in. At least that's the feeling I have. And that when that time comes, I don't know what's going to happen. So it's a constant conflict in my, in my marriage, in my profession, in my life, just in my everyday existence. Um, so I have to keep reminding myself that I am Peter, I am married, I am a human, I live here, I have, I have a job, I have my work, my clients, and that this is what's important today. And when and if the ETs show up, then I'll deal with that when it happens. It's my honest feeling that this is a spiritual awakening, a growth process. I think the time has come where they're trying to contact us. Some intelligence is entering into our world uh, that we do not control. It is not simply a projection of the human mind, and that that intelligence has a purpose of some sort. Julie Lewin is a remarkable woman. She appears to have the power to diagnose illness without carrying out a full medical check. She says she can cure some medical problems with the power of the mind. Julie is not a fanatic or a crank. She's a normal person who may have a rare gift. There's obviously some um, outside force at work that you know we can't account for, I don't think, in, uh, in sort of ordinary uh, medical or psychological terms. I don't know what you'd call it, but she definitely has got an ability to pick these things up and see them. And I'm sure that she just sits there and uh, sees them. Last week, we introduced you to Julie Lewin, a psychic healer who seems to be able to pinpoint medical problems without a conventional diagnosis, sometimes without even meeting her subjects. Is that Daniel? Yes. Daniel, it's Julie Lewin. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. How are you? We showed you a telephone conversation between Julie and a young man called Daniel. Julie had no idea at the time that Daniel suffered from a rare disease. Yet, 15 minutes after this call, she was able to tell him about many of his symptoms. When I think back, at, at first when she told me a lot of the stuff, I was thinking, oh, I'm not really sure about that. But then when I spoke about it with my family, we worked out what it would have been and what it could have been. And it seems like she was pretty spot on with just about everything in the end. Daniel is just an average teenager. But John Jenkins is a psychologist and a mathematician. His wife Marjorie is a former nurse. After a short session with Julie Lewin, in which she correctly named at least six of his medical problems, this was John Jenkins' verdict. It may sound familiar. All of it was absolutely spot on, which was quite amazing. Marjorie Jenkins, too, had her problems. The most debilitating was a mysterious respiratory ailment that seriously affected her breathing. The last 18 months, two years, I've been going to the doctors and specialists and tests and everything else and I spent a quarter of an hour with Julie and she found that and she did it. So, I mean, um, that's all I can say, that there is somebody who doesn't profess to be a medical person, but she can pick up something in a quarter of an hour that all the specialists, with all their training, can't find what's wrong. She said, I will give you um, concentrated healing for the next five days and this is absent healing which she did and I have been breathing so much more easily ever since then it is just amazing so I think that she has got a great gift 
to help people and to work with doctors. That healing process was conducted, as Marjorie describes it, in absence. She and Julie were not even in the same room. Not even in the same suburb. Hello. Hello. Yes, Lynn? Yes, it is. Hi, Lynn. It's Julie Lewin. How Hi, Julie. How are you? Good. Good. What do you need me to tell you? I just need your name, your full name. And it was this apparent long-distance gift Little that we decided to test again. The patient is our production manager, Lynn Taylor. She's never met, never even spoken to Julie Lewin before this telephone call. And I need your age. Uh, 36. Mm -hmm. And date of birth. 12th of June, 1958. It'll take me probably about 15 minutes, and then I'll give you a call back and tell you what I found. Bye-bye. All I needed to know was her name, her address, her age and her date of birth. Um, I didn't need to speak to her. You could have just told me those details and I could have done it. Just those few facts and 15 minutes of meditation. According to Julie, that's all it takes. Enough for her to be able to call Lynn back and pass on a few general observations. Hi. Then this assessment. Well, actually, what I also picked up was a problem in the left hand, uh, in the palm of the hand, mm -hmm. and I felt that maybe there'd been a cut in there. No cuts. Okay, so I certainly picked up... Um, is there, like, not some feeling in there? Um, there is um, a carpal tunnel problem, yes, with slight loss of feeling in the left hand at the moment. Okay, so that's that there. Right shoulder and down the back shoulder blade. Just um, like, um, just pain. Um, an uncomfortable feeling. When she phoned back, the first thing she said was she picked a, a number of problems in my upper arms and across the back of my neck, which do relate to a condition I have called carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, it's basically, it cuts off circulation in the hands and leaves you without feeling in the hands. I've had this condition for oh, probably 10 years or so. Now it's, it's not a physical appearing condition. Even if Julie had been able to see me, there is no way that she would have been able to tell that I suffered from that condition. Then we go down the right leg. I didn't see any problem with that, but as you walked, I, it sort of was like a limp. Oh. And the right foot doesn't actually come right the way down to the ground. Well, yeah, it could be, but I wouldn't have even noticed it. That was Lynn's immediate reaction. But after she thought more about Julie's comments, there was a change of heart. After I had the conversation with Julie, I was talking to one of our producers who indeed told me that that was true. They'd noticed from behind when they were walking, watching me walk that I do favour one side, so I wouldn't call it a limp, but it, it's there nonetheless. Looking back on the situation, I really don't know how Julie could pick so many things that were right about me down a telephone in another city and she's never met me. I really don't know how she did it, but it was quite amazing. For Julie Lewin, it's not all that amazing. She says this gift that seems so rare could really be very common. We could all possess it, but few of us know how to harness it. To that end, she's pressing for serious research into this area of the unknown, so that more and more people can develop skills like hers. And in that aim, Julie Lewin has the wholehearted support of psychologist John Jenkins and his wife Marjorie. The Jenkins accept there will be sceptics, but at least they have the conviction and the comfort that they have experienced Julie Lewin's gifts. Well, I think that she should be working with the medical profession, although obviously I think there are some uh, cases where she can work entirely on her own. Well, all I can say is, open your mind. Please open your mind and be prepared to try it and listen. Because there is help for you if you need it. But you, you must open your mind. We've heard stories of amazing escapes from death. 
We talk about cats having nine lives and we've read about lost dogs who've found their way home over incredible distances and against great odds. But we've never heard anything that matches the feet of a remarkable family dog who goes by the name of Brownie. You see, Brownie came back from his grave. Surviving the evolutionary elements of nature is a challenge for man and beast in the sparse desert plains around Artesia, New Mexico. The day-to-day -day chain of endurance ebbs back and forth. Farmers try to scratch life from the earth that is dry and brittle. An ongoing war between farm dogs and coyotes leaves casualties on both sides. And the death of God's creatures through summer heat and winter cold becomes an accepted part of the plan. We have cows and horses and things out here that die on us. And, you know, we, we have to bury them. We're not naive to seeing things that are dead. Mary Bratcher, a farmer's wife, has tended dying cows, buried the corpses of coyotes and dogs, and hardened herself for the expectations of life on a hard land. But neither Mary nor her family were ready for an event that happened just before Easter 1994. Something happened to a small farm dog named Brownie. It was their three-year-old son's beloved pet. Now, on that morning, I had borrowed my little brother's truck to go to the grocery store. And his truck is higher than my car. I'm used to driving something low to the ground where I can see. And um, I, whenever I was leaving out of the driveway, I'd already turned around and I was driving off. There wasn't anything around. I didn't see anything. I felt a bump. And then another bump. And um, I knew right away that I, I had to have ran over something. I, I was pretty sure it was one of the dogs. I saw him laying there. And I put the car into park real fast and told the kids not to get out and ran back to where he was. And he was just laying there. He never cried. He never made a sound. His chest swelled up real big, and then it went down real low, and it sank in, and then he, he just quit moving. As Mary drove off with her two children, Aaron and Toby, she wanted to keep from them the tragedy of what had just happened, at least until she could find the right words. When I got back in the truck, um, Toby kept... He, he didn't say anything, and Aaron kept insisting on knowing if I'd ran over her dog. She kept saying, Mom, did you run over my dog? And I knew I had to tell Toby, so I told Toby that I ran over his dog. He got real mad. He wouldn't talk to me. He, he looked at me and finally said, my brownie's not dead. Back at the farmhouse, Mary's brother Jeffrey knew what he had to do and set about the grim task of burying Toby's dog. He had buried many animals on the farm here before but a part of Toby's spirit would be interred on this day. He wrapped the puppy in a blanket and took him to a distant field. The work was difficult because of the hardened desert soil. One of Brownie's brothers looked on. In half an hour, the burial was complete. Brownie had been laid to rest beneath a packed soil. Brownie, barely a year old, had been one of a large litter. And back at the house, the dog's mother and siblings seemed to sense a loss. For Mary, the return home that afternoon was filled with trepidation. The sadness in Toby's eyes tore at her heart. He's either going to be scarred for life of, over it, or he's going to grow up and, and resent me or, or something, you know. The next morning, Mary Bratcher called Toby in from the fields. He had been outside since dawn, calling out for his dog. With Brownie's mother, he had scoured the sagebrush and the dry fields. As Mary watched, she could feel her heart literally breaking. In desperation, she decided on a day at the beach in Carlsbad, 50 kilometers away. Maybe she could take her son's mind off his grief. 
we went to Carlsbad to the beach, and he had forgot all about his dog the whole time we were there. He found some little kids to play with. And for a few hours at least, Toby seemed to be his old self. They did nothing but play all afternoon, and uh, I felt so much better thinking, well, I took him, we had a good time today, he's going to be over it. Yet the return home on this second day without Brownie brought Mary deep anxiety. As she drove up toward the trailer farm, a group of the farm dogs became visible at the front. As the pickup truck drew closer, she saw what seemed to be an horrendous vision. The corpse of Brownie, apparently dug up from his grave and dragged to the front of the house. The dog was laying on the ground in front of the steps and his mom was laying by him and I thought, oh God. I thought she had drug him up and was either mourning over him or gonna eat him. And uh, I told the kids to stay in and they, they, he saw him, Toby saw his dog. He said, they're my brownie and he got all excited. And I was just gonna run up and grab him and get rid of him somehow. Then suddenly, impossibly, Brownie's eyes opened. For 36 hours, Toby Bratch's pet dog, Brownie, had been buried three feet deep under the hardened desert earth of the field in New Mexico. Yet as Toby's mother arrived back at the family's trailer farm the afternoon of the second day, she was jolted by the sight of his corpse lying motionless at the front of the house. And suddenly, an impossible thing happened. Brownie's eyes opened. I ran up to grab him, the dog moved his head, and it scared the living daylights out of me. It really did, I mean, I, I didn't know what to think. But then I got real excited, because I thought, well, the dog's alive, you know, that after all this arguing that we did, and all the, the hurt feelings and everything, the dog is alive. And um, I picked the dog up and put him in the back of the truck, and Toby wanted to see him, but like I said, when I ran over the dog, he was a, it was a really gross sight with his, his face the way it was. And so I put the dog in the back of the truck, and I drove down here to use my mother's phone, and I was just hysterical. From her mother's house, Mary called local veterinarian William Livingston and her brother Jeffrey. Jeffrey thought I was... Um, playing a really cruel trick on him. And I said, no, Jeffrey, the dog's not dead. And Jeffrey said, I buried the dog, he's dead. And uh, I told him the dog was out in the back of the truck and the veterinarian said he'd see him and we could make payments and work something with him. And um, Jeffrey looked over at me and he just, he said, are you serious? I said, yes, I'm serious. And I said, come out here, really, you gotta see him, the dog's alive. And Jeffrey still to this day will not touch the dog, won't have anything to do with the dog. He thinks the dog is a poltergeist. He, he honestly believes that the dog is, because he, he insists that the dog was dead and that he, you know, he said, I buried him, the dog didn't move, the dog, you know, he said the dog was dead. Mary's husband, Kenneth, was equally disbelieving. She called me, it was about 24 hours later, I guess, or probably longer than that, and uh, said that he was alive. And, you know, I had to think about it a second there, and I thought, what? He's alive, what do you mean? And she said, well, he's alive. And I said, how do you, how do you know he's alive, you know? And she said, well, he's in the back of my, in the back of the truck, uh, Jeffrey's truck. And, uh, you know, I just couldn't believe it. And I said, well, didn't he bury him? She said, yeah. Kenneth had seen animals in pain too often on the land, and his first instinct was to have Brownie put out of his misery. I just told her, have Jeffrey shoot him, you know, because I figured he'd have brain damage the rest of his life, or, you know, he'd never be the same. At the animal clinic, Brownie was cleaned and underwent a series of operations. Dr. Livingston said that he might be paralyzed, that one leg may be paralyzed because he wasn't using it and wasn't even trying to use it. The veterinarian had to cut his eye completely because it, it didn't look so bad with the dirt all over it. 
but the eye was all and it was already dried by the time I'd taken him to the vet from you know being out that long and he the poor dog he was just covered in dirt and that eye was hanging out and he was just his little tail started moving he kept trying to wagging his little tail and we laughed so hard and Toby was kept trying to come up to the table where it was and we kept saying no you don't want to see him you can't see him Dr. Livingston promised to have his secretary call with a progress report as Brownie's life hung in the balance throughout the night. And the next day, Angie, his assistant, called me up and said, you know, you're not, you're not going to believe this. The dog is doing great. I mean, he's up. Um, he wasn't using the leg. They put a cast on it, hoping that he would use it. And uh, he was up, you know, just wagging his tail and... When we came in, the first thing he did was Toby ran over and grabbed him. He licked Toby all over his face, and, you know, it was just um, incredible to see the dog. He was dragging the little cast around, and his eye was so shut, and it was so cute because it looked like he was winking with the stitches in and everything, and it, it didn't look bad at all, and they gave him a bath and got him all pretty, and he was just, um, it, it looked like a completely different dog. On a land where the chain of survival ebbs back and forth, and the harsh realities of nature leave casualties as a matter of course, the story of a death and resurrection around the time of Easter brought special meaning to the people of Artesia, New Mexico. Dr. Livingston's theory is that Brownie was in a coma. He explained to us that when I'd ran over the dog's head, and it, the pressure from his brain caused him to go into a coma. Kenneth Bratcher believes Brownie's mother and siblings dug him out of the hard earth. There was little piles of dirt around the hole and uh, just on one side and little paw prints all around in all the loose dirt all over the place. And that just, you could just tell by looking at it that that's what happened. Jeffrey, the young man who buried Brownie, has been fundamentally changed by the experience. He didn't want anything to do with what he called the poltergeist dog. For a decade, he was one of the most recognizable faces on TV worldwide, a fixture on the TV series Dallas. Part of the group that included J.R. Ewing, Jock Ewing, and the business rival Cliff Barnes, a trio of Texas oilmen who would sacrifice a limb to win a business deal. Ken Kershival was the rival Barnes, head to head against the notorious J.R. Barnes was the fighter, and like most of Larry Hagman's opponents, the ultimate loser. Kershaw was never really comfortable in this world of oil, greed and deceit. He grew up the son of a country doctor in a small town in Indiana and used to make house calls with his father. Memories of simpler times bring instant emotion to Kershaw these days. A sort of second father came into his life when he met the man who played Jock Ewing, the late actor Jim Davis. Davis died of brain cancer several years back. His passing left Ken Kershaw with an experience he will never forget. I was at Jim's house the day before he died. There was a hospital bed that was set up in his living room. And uh, I went over. We all went over. And uh, he was Kalatos. And there was a, a nurse there. And she was saying to me, although he was Kalatos, she was saying, don't worry, he can hear. He can understand. You may think he can't understand, but he can understand. There was music going on. And, and, and a song started to play called Yesterdays. And Blanche, his wife, um, blanched. And she said, I says, what? And she says, that was one of, one of Jim's favorite songs. 
And she said, you know, every time we would go out to a nightclub, it used to be a very popular song, very popular song. She said, every time we would go out to a nightclub, this and that and the other, and they would play that, Jim would always get me up on the bandstand to sing this song to him. And she says, and I used to hate to sing this song to him. She says, but I would always do it. Yesterday's. I said to her, so sing it to him. And I think she was a bit embarrassed that I was there and asking her to do that. And she said, ah. And I said, no, Blanche, sing it to him. She said, nah. And uh, I put my arms around her. And I said, Blanche, sing Jim the song. And I left her in. Yesterdays, yesterdays, days that were sweet, happy, sequestered days. And uh, I heard her sing. I heard her sing. I heard her singing in the song. following day, I was in my home in the Palisades, and I was walking downstairs to the bedroom, and I had the radio on. I never have the radio on. I have tapes on. I have disc on. I never have the radio on. I had the radio on. And uh, I was like literally, literally halfway down the stairs. And uh, I heard yesterday's. And I just stopped. And I said, Jim's gone. I, uh, I talked to Larry Katzman, who was our producer, who was as close to any of us as anybody. And I talked to him that evening, and I said, uh, when did Jim die? And he says, oh, somewhere around. And, and when I heard this, because I, I made note, I made note it was 123. And he said, uh, I think it was like uh, 124, 128. End of story.